Yeah, Thanks, yeah. well, it might be some time. Okay, now I have been advised that I have been ill-advised and that the advice that I got that questions should be had during debate was incorrect. And because there was a covering report, uh, th then uh, it was open to me to have questions before the debate, which is what I would normally do. Uh, so I'm apologising for that. If I, get, I got the wrong advice. Uh, and, and I can understand why uh, some of you may have thought that those questions in the debate were separate. So what we're going to do, somewhere here, there's a, now that you've given me this advice, you've taken it away again. So um, standing order 23.5 is a revocation or alteration by resolution at the same meeting. So what I am proposing to do is that we revoke the last, uh, the resolution and we do it again. I'm happy to swap. I'm happy to swap them. Um, so um, I take it that I'm moving from the chair that we revoke um, the resolution uh, on um, the notice of um, motion on 17. Seconded. Ticket to Councillor Lord. Um, that's a procedural motion, so I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carried. And we will now uh, re resume. Now, can I take it, and I don't take this for granted, can, can I take, don't give me any more advice, right? Can I take it that um, most of you have asked questions. Are there, are there any further questions? Because let's, let's keep this clean. Are there any further questions? with regard to this. Right. If there are none, then we can... So can I invite the mover to remove and then we'll go into discussion and everyone will get a chance to speak. <clears throat> I will so move. And in doing so, I would remind councillors that um, there was an attempt by this authority to establish a unitary council in the region. And don't forget, we are talking about the Otago region, not just Dunedin and something else. Uh, at the time of the local government reorganisation um, reform in 1989, at that time, uh, <coughs> representatives of this council visited uh, Clutha and Queenstown Lakes and Central Otago. And those authorities, with the exception of Queenstown Lakes, were supportive of investigating unitary council at the time. Queenstown Lakes, in the shape of the mayor of the day, uh, Cooper Warren, um, didn't because bad, evil, ugly Dunedin wouldn't, quote, wouldn't let them have an airport. Um, he was given that assurance by the other authorities there would be no objection to such at the time, but nonetheless didn't change his position and therefore that, uh, <coughs> that initiative failed. Um, so when people talk about a regional council, they need to do so, uh, a unitary authority, they need to do so in the context of what has since transpired. I think realistically, talking about it, uh, some idea that a regional council might be Dunedin and our friends up at the ORC and only this part of the territory is Dreamland. What unitary authorities are about are much larger territories and if anyone thinks uh, that those other authorities would buy into a discussion of that kind, um, good luck with that. Uh, I think that's part of the context. The main reason for the res revocation uh, that I'm now moving for the 15th time, uh, or at least the third, is because, like most of you here, I'm sick of the unpleasant, aggressive and boorish um, obsession that this has become. And I think the sooner we put that issue to sleep, the better. Councillor Wiley. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I guess the key thing that we learnt from this whole motion and process was firstly 
actually how much workload our staff are trying to undertake at the moment. And I think that was one thing that I got loud and clear from the emails. Uh, they are really doing it probably over and above than what they actually should do at times. And I can see that in some of their faces when you see them in the corridors and you can see how tired and drained they look. So I can totally understand why this um, paper, draft paper, never really advanced as far along as it could have or should have. And I'm extremely disappointed on that. But at the same time, I do believe that I was quite comfortable to see it sit for a period longer because I did think it was going to show some really good outcomes. Unfortunately, we'll never know, and maybe we will move a motion sometime in the future. But uh, at the meantime, my vote will still stay the same. Thank you. Councillor Vanders. Revocation is a really big deal. It's recognised as being a really big deal to revoke a properly constituted council resolution in standing orders up and down the country by having quite a large number of requirements in order to make a revocation. If it was easy to revoke a council resolution, it would happen quite often, potentially, especially with a council that perhaps is a bit more divided than ours, and it would be very difficult for anything to get done. So I think that we have to accept, first of all, that revocation and the rules that go around it are there for a very good reason, and it's not just some kind of arbitrary, uh, stickling kind of issue that we're dealing with. In attempting to revoke this particular report, this unitary council report, what we are in effect doing, if we revoke it as looks likely, is we are saying, we don't want to know. The old saying, uh, to be or not to be, is that's the question. The question here is, do we want to know or do we not want to know? And I believe that as a council that has had and continues to have enormous issues trying to be the other half of the local government of this city that we really need to at least look at, I'm not saying do it, but we really need to look at what a regional council, DCC, unitary council would look like. It doesn't mean that the regional council disappears, far from it. As I would understand it, if you were to combine and have one council, you would have all the people from the regional council with bus experience, for instance, uh, would, would be in the new council. You would have some councillors from the existing regional council in the new council. This is at least one of the possibilities that could be looked at. And it would be a possibility that the problems that we currently have with the transport system, for instance, where the regional council runs the buses and we provide the bus stations and they want the hub and we have to try and design it. And these two quite separate organisations are trying to achieve the same thing is inevitably a structure that's going to cause problems. Councillor Benson Pope has quite rightly pointed to our dual local government as a child of the reform of 1989. It's a, a, a the, the, the divisions that were created in 1989 were created because it was necessary to get amalgamation to happen, it was necessary to get people on board, and quite frankly, it was necessary to give jobs to a bunch of small councils that didn't want to know otherwise. And that's what the regional council was there for. The artificial divisions where the regional council gets our port, but we get to control the roads to it. And then they get the buses. And uh, it, it's, 
it's not a possible structure that can optimise value for Dunedin. And we have seen Dunedin suffer as a result. Dunedin is the only city that I know of that's a coastal city that has a wasteland for a foreshore. And it's not to blame the Regional Council or the DCC. The fact is the Regional Council own most of that land. When we want to try and do something with it, their agenda and our agenda are coming from different uh, backgrounds and different requirements, and we just can't get the thing to come together. So we're at a turning point. We're at a turning point in terms of local government. There was a great turning point in 1989 when we had that lot of reform. Potentially, we could have another, even more positive turning point in the future if we consider the unitary council and we get staff when they have time at some time in the future to actually finish what was started. It's not just a turning point, this revocation. It's a tipping point for this council. It's the tipping point that says, are we going to go forward and look at any new possible structures or are we going to say, no, we don't even want to consider what might be available in the Unitary Council report. Over two years ago, mm. we all, every one of us here, thought that actually considering, just getting a report on it, might be a good idea. What has fundamentally changed since then? We've been given reasons for the delays, and I've questioned those. And I've had to accept some of the answers. I don't accept all of them. We are now in a situation where we can decide whether or not this unitary council report will, at some time in the future, when staff have time, actually inform us or whether we simply don't want to know. Do we want to know or do we want to stick our heads in the sand? That's what we need to decide. Now. And so Wilson. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm in that incongruous position of agreeing with Councillor Vandervis while I disagree with Councillor Vandervis. Um, he has many, many times told us that we shouldn't put motions up without a report. And this is one instant, uh, um, one situation where when we made this motion, we didn't have a report on it, and I think it was ill advised to have followed on and moved it. And I apologise for my part in. <laughs> Um, actually agreeing to it, because had I known it was going to be such a big amount of work, I wouldn't have put it on the work stream. I, it's an interesting piece. I had understood when we did that that it would be a relatively easy piece of, paper, uh, piece of work, um, and I found otherwise. So I, um, I don't... The other part of that is, is that we've got, there is a mechanism in the Local Government Act for anyone to actually apply to do this. It doesn't have to come from our council. Um, we may heard a statement earlier that this has been a, something of great interest. I have yet to hear anyone come along to annual plan and ask us to be driving this. It isn't a high priority as far as I've heard from our community. Um, I have heard our community, and I heard it today from out in the streets and, out, and people coming to our table, as I have more and more increasingly loudly hearing about climate change. That is where we need to put our resources and our efforts. And I'm, I am in this really concerned space that we're, we're focusing on the things that won't make a difference to our community. This is one of those things that, while I can understand some frustrations, I think they've improved, but that isn't what's going to make a big difference to us as a community. We need action and we need to work together to get the claim, uh, climate change dealt with and have a, few, a much better understanding of what those work streams are for both councils. That's, um, I think those are the priorities that I'm hearing from our community. I also think it's incongruous that we're laying on um, when we often hear that we have too many staff or that we need to be not ha employing so many staff. We're getting things added again without report reports, without an understanding of the impact on the work plans, um, to, and, and then expecting those to just appear from staff. So that's why I think, uh, that's why I'm, not, I'm going to um, uh, approve this motion. Um, and ask that you consider the workload, especially with wh um, what's coming before us in the next three days. Um, if this 
is one of those key issues that we should be dealing with, or actually there are much, uh, much more constructive things for our staff to be working on. I also want to take exception to the manner of the emails that have come. Um, there are so many matters of equal importance to this. Um, there are actions under the, climate, uh, the um, environmental plan that we've sought and haven't yet um, got a reports on. Um, there are track audits. There are whole, at every department, every level, there's work that we have asked for and we're, that has been delayed because of those work priorities. Again, if we want to keep on adding things in, and I'm sure we'll do that in the next um, three days, I think we have to really consider whether this is one of those ones, whether we've got the support to carry and, um, on with this sort of work, or whether the community have asked us for much greater priority. Councillor O'Malley. Bishop. Um, there was mention of bad behaviour, um, and I reckon there has been a fair amount of bad behaviour going down around this. Um, I want to talk about, just as we're going forward, a lot of mentions have been made of the Council ELT meeting, and I'm concerned about that particular meeting because there are no minutes taken there. And so when something comes out of it, it's a hearsay <coughs> environment as to what was actually said, because you're trying to recall, with no minutes, what was said up to a year ago or longer. In addition, which it is not a, prop, it is not a public meeting <coughs> environment. And so we have an issue there too of potentially we might be making decisions in a situation that is non-public and to which there are no minutes being taken. So I'm concerned about what may go on there. I am surprised as this has unfolded that we have been told that it's due to a lack of resources because we are going into our annual plan and we just set the year ago forward spending and staffing for appropriate things. And apparently we were not brought forward, was not brought forward to us that we did not have sufficient resources to staff our own resolutions. And that would be kind of a nice piece of information to have got at the long-term plan because we could have made a decision as to whether or not we wanted to staff it more or not. The tool that might be most useful to us, and I hope we see it soon, is an out understanding of how many resolutions are outstanding. In that way, we'll definitely know whether or not we can't ask for any more, and maybe we would sit down and actually have another formal meeting of saying, actually, let's pair these ones off because they don't relate. But at the moment, this is an unusual event we're doing here where we are reversing a resolution almost by itself, almost out of context of really what are we prioritising here. Because we're hearing that this is a prioritisation of work, but we don't have a list as to what is being prioritised. Councillor Benson Pope suggested that if we were to form a unitary council, it would include all of Otago. I don't think so. I mean, I, and, and I don't think it's naive or stupid or, or lacking of knowledge or whatever to assume that it would only encourage, it would only contain our current boundaries, because we have already an artificially large boundary. We have already incorporated in Silver Peaks and. Um, and our own suburban areas, Mosgill. We did that amalgamation back in the past. Our territorial area completely contains our transport system. And, and that would have been brought up in this, uh, presumably that would have been brought up in this report. And I remind you again, this was not a resolution to form a unitary council. This was a resolution to compare the advantages and disadvantages of forming a unitary council. And it would have been able to, uh, it would have illustrated for us the, the challenges and the rewards for doing it. We would have been then in a position to make an informed decision as to what we want to do. We appear to be wanting to not be informed because the effort to get that information is too great. I hope that we come back to visit this again in the future. We pretty much know how this vote's going to go down. But I will remind everybody else as well, it's quite useful to have the videos because you can go back and actually see what was said on the day. And I actually haven't had a chance to go back, but I remember that day quite clearly. Councillor Vandervis was complaining about our poor relationship with the Unitary Council, and he was implored by the Mayor, why don't you do something about it? Why don't you pass a resolution? Two years, and we hear this quite often. Why don't you do something about it? Why don't you pass a resolution? And now we're sitting here saying, oh, let's not bother, let's back it off. So that might be why people don't
put the resolutions up. Thank you. Councillor Stedman. Thank you, Worship. A um, uh, bit of a conundrum. I've listened to Councillor Van um, and very rational and compelling in his discussion. He is a smart man, um, but sometimes this is, remember, this, this resolution, why we're here, was not actually about the actual resolution it was itself. We've got the staff that are under pressure. They've been asked by us to do certain jobs in our city, and one of those is Provincial Growth Fund. But this was more about stopping the behaviour. Um, we know the reality of what that behaviour was, the stress our staff were put under, and those questions, and the harassment, and that. So we must not forget that. Th this is what this is about. The resolution itself is fine. I understand where it comes from, and I hear Councillor Vandervis, and as I said, it was rational and compelling now in an afterthought, but I do not want to see staff getting abused in emails Etc. That's just something that really cuts my grain. I absolutely hate that sort of behaviour, and that's why I was in support of re revoking this resolution. Actions have consequences, so we've got to remember the original reason why we revoked this resolution. Thank you. Ms. Laguerre. Dear Worship, I don't disagree with the idea of exploring uh, what a unitary authority would mean. I don't disagree with it at all. However, this is not the time. And it's not the time because we have been told, and I know it to be true, that workloads do not permit it. I have seen that go down in the department that I work most closely with, Enterprise Dunedin where staff there have been working on a provincial growth fund <coughs> uh, application. I've seen it with the team uh, that would have been doing this work. Uh, just the incredible and sudden, really, uh, workload they have had. Um, none of us were expecting the provincial growth fund. Uh, I don't believe uh, we had a change of government. That was quite a surprise, in a way. And then uh, the Provincial Growth Fund came out of that change. And uh, a year ago or more, I don't think any of us expected the gift uh, of the design for the waterfront. Um, that was something that was not in our plan either. But we were able to be agile and respond. We had to be. All the stars aligned. Uh, and it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to do so. Um, if we're going to be responsible employers, then we need to be cognizant of those workloads. Uh, in terms of the relationship with the Regional Council, we have been told clearly uh, by those uh, of our staff uh, that this was a delicate time in terms of negotiation and partnership on a number of fronts. For from that point of view, it's not appropriate. We have elections coming. And again, the timing of this is not appropriate. It muddies the waters. In terms of uh, motions not being carried out, I just want to talk a little bit about the motion that I felt passionate about. And that was around working with the ORC around harbour matters and harbourage assets. And I can remember really clearly, as I alluded to earlier, that the chief executive, when I asked, well, where is that up to, um, was very clear, look, we just don't have the resources to progress this. And I was disappointed. But I don't believe um, that I followed up in the manner in which this was followed up. And it brings me to my final point. Um, the manner in which we deal with disappointment, the manner in which we deal uh, with things not going our way, is really important to remind ourselves of, and a little bit of kindness and respect, particularly when it comes to our staff, would go a very long way, because I believe that each and every one of them come to work with a commitment to serve the city in a passionate and committed way. And uh, so we need to keep that in mind and remember that when we are dealing with staff and asking questions. Thank you. Councillor Staines. 
Thank you, Your Worship. I think it's important to look a little bit of the history around this to understand why, well, for me, to understand why I would change my mind. Why did we have the resolution in the first place? We had it because of significant frustration. If I remember rightly, I voted for it. We were frustrated about the lack of cooperation with the ORC, which was hindering the work that we were trying to get done. So, if you like, it was a shot across the bows. Those frustrations have since reduced considerably. We're seeing much more cooperation, both at the elected member level, but certainly at staff level. So if we look at our workload, we have so many things that we want to get done. We have a whole lot of climate change stuff. And you know, my view is we talk a lot about climate change, but we've done very little on the ground. So should, do we want our staff to be working on addressing climate change, and we're going to have that debate undoubtedly in the next few days over whether we put some money into the can so that we can do some work, that will occupy staff time. So do we really think, as a council, that the reason that we originally wanted this paper is still valid, it's still a high priority? If it hadn't been raised in an aggressive way, that where is this, why hasn't we got it, it would have probably been st still sitting in our box and live. But that, you know, we've heard about the email traffic, and it was, some of it was pretty hurtful stuff. And that's not appropriate for this body. Is that really what we want to focus our energy on when we've got all of this other stuff that we, would, we need to get done? So my appeal to councillors around this table is think about it. If we vote not to rescind this motion, then what we are saying to staff is this is now a priority. Push aside other work, do this. Is that what we really want? Or do we want our staff to focus on more important issues? So I'd urge you to vote to rescind it. Or if we have to have it, that it takes very low priority because I don't think it's important right now. Councillor Elder. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that we're getting to debate this um, today. I think it's really important. Um, and I think the resolution, which was passed unanimously to um, look at unitary council, was, it, was at heart a good one. And I still still believe it is because, in fact, we share so much. Um, it doesn't mean that we will become a unitary council. It's just looking at the pros and cons. And hopefully what would come out of it is how we go forward with a better relationship. Um, I do not like, though, how the, the, the pressure that's been put on people. I do not like how um, the process has been managed. Um, and one of the reasons I asked Sandy about um, having resolutions is that um, I feel like we need a way to track where resolutions are and have a good discussion. Hey, this is low priority now, um, you know, and then it might come up later because indeed people's workloads have been huge and the PGF has just doubled that. Um, and so I, I believe tracking resolutions is a way forward and having the orange, red or green light um, and being have it, having it on our um, papers because then we can keep an eye on it. So then this kind of um, ignoring it and then it coming up, um, would not happen. So, well, that's what I think anyway. But I, I really have not enjoyed this process at all. Um, but I still think it's a good um, resolution. So I'll be voting for it. Councillor Thank you, Worship. Uh, what a bugger's muddle this has turned into. Uh, we're not talking 
about our behaviour here, we're not talking necessarily about workload. To borrow from my esteemed colleague, what we're talking about is process. And I think if something is going to be removed, a resolution is going to be removed, um, we need to go through an official channel, not, not a casual conversation that may or may not have happened to two or three people or uh, a, even uh, a full uh, sit down at the ELT. If we, if we make a resolution and we vote on a resolution, uh, being a naive first term councillor, I thought that just happened. I just thought that's what we did. That's what we were here to do when that happened. Now, I'm not, I'm not for a moment suggesting that uh, the workload isn't an issue. I know there's a hell of a lot on, and I get that. But we need to follow a process here rather than just let it drop off. If it hadn't been checked on, would it have, would it have continued? Um, I also am slightly concerned about um, the amount of outstanding resolutions that we may or may not have, and no one knows. Again, as a naive first-term councillor, I thought our job was to pass these resolutions, and then they happened. If that's not the case, when do we find out? When do we get these updates? Again, I'm not saying that the, council, uh, that the staff aren't working hard. I'm not saying that they can't get to them. But we need to know. You can't just, just leave it. We're, making, we're forced to make a lot of assumptions here. We're forced to um, make the assumption that it's going to be a negative outcome uh, for a relationship with the ORC, when it may not be. We might find synergies and efficiencies that work for both, and more importantly, work for our ratepayers. Um, I think we definitely do need to track our outstanding resolutions one way or the other. Um, and as we, as no one's being unreasonable here in that, that capacity, everyone uh, appreciates the workload. So I think we just need to know where things are. And if they aren't a priority, I think we need to vote again. If we vote for a resolution, we need to vote it down. And we, yeah, we've got there now. We're revoking it now. But my God, the ill will and ill feeling around this table over this is just embarrassing. Um, I also think that um, we're, we're forced to assume that our neighbours um, wouldn't be interested um, in this. Again, we, we're coming from a negative point of view here, and we, we just don't know. I mean, there may be efficiencies and synergies there uh, for the other councils as well, and we may never know. I voted for this, I voted against this, I'm all over the show, I'm confused. I didn't like the process. I didn't like the process. Um, it was hurried, and I think sometimes expediency is used to force a result. As a naive first-term councillor, I fell for that one. Uh, it won't happen again, but thank you. I'm not telling you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I just wanted to clear my bias in terms of being, um, uh, having been a Treaty of Waitangi, Te Treaty of Waitangi um, education activist person for the last four decades or three decades of my life, three and a half. And so um, in 2017, when we took the unanimous resolution to explore or asking the staff to come up with a report with the pros and cons, I was already initially apprehensive because I'm speaking as 2.1, you know, one of the 2.1 um, Pacifica um, elected members throughout this country, which is quite pathetic, but that goes to the heart in, in terms of how democracy works against um, indigenous peoples and ethnic minorities. So I was already apprehensive, um, but I heard the, 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 the cordial um, from my colleagues, particularly uh, those from uh, Harbour, uh, with respect to Harbour Edge assets, and um, I took note of uh, Councillor Benson Pope's um, enthusiasm for this idea, this concept, um, given the history that had happened with amalgamation. So, but I was apprehensive because I, I um, uh, was aware of the negative impact that the Auckland Unitary Council has had on Indigenous uh, communities. Um, if you just look at the way that Māori were treated at that table, um, given the fact that they hardly got access to the table in the first place, and that the impact that, um, that a unitary council has had on the smaller cities of Auckland. So I was apprehensive, but I was prepared to um, see how this went within our particular area. So um, I, am, I, am, I just want to acknowledge Councillor Benson Pope for his apologies uh, in, in terms of this process, and also uh, Councillor Wilson for her apologies. Um, I, I think we we can get all emotional about the, um, the 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 treatment of the staff in terms of the email exchanges and all the the, um, 
the, the way that we've treated each other around, <clears throat> around the table. I wasn't at the 30th of April meeting, but for me, it's the overarching thing is our relationship with mana whenua and how we actually practice as a territorial authority our, our commitment to te Triti or Waitangi and sustainable development or whatever you call it that um, underpin our H strategy. So for me, any debate about a report that would have come um, would have focused on really, is this really how we want to go? Because as far as I can see, being a very minority, minority person at this table, I would say that um, our chances of representation in a unitary council would be close to zero. Kia ora. For the speakers. Right, well, <clears throat> Councillor O'Malley is right. Um, I um, provoked this original resolution and I voted for it. And at the time, I thought it was the right thing to do and frankly if there hadn't been the brouhaha about it lying <clears throat> on the table for a while I'd probably still be quite happy to have it there as long as it got done sometime but that has um, become untenable but actually my reasoning for uh, supporting revocation now is not only about um, staff workloads it's about timing because the responsibilities of regional councils right now are in the spotlight. Huge changes are potentially afoot. Uh, the, the pressure on regional councils around this country to lift um, freshwater quality in a very short time frame are intense. Some of them are almost flying apart, partly because of lack of capability and, and, and partly because they've just got behind the eight ball. The last thing I want right now is to be taking something on that is in a complete state of flux. The um, Environmental Protection Agency is, just, is, is about to be given responsibilities the same as regional councils. And the minister has made it quite clear. He's putting the pressure on regional councils, putting uh, some tension in the system. This is just not, we, it's not a matter of um, not, not wanting to know it's, it's a matter of not being able to know at the moment because things are in a state of flux. Anything could be uh, on the table with regional councils in the next wee while. The last thing I want to do is be buying into, for our staff, as well as for us, an unknown quantity that's under immense pressure. So th that's among the reasons why I'm um, supportive of revoking this at the moment. It's not to say that it can't be considered again in the future. Um, Councillor Vincent Pope, you'll write a reply. Okay. We will um, do this again by division. Thanks, Lynn. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Alder. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Hall is gone, sorry. Aye. <laughs> <coughs> Councillor Hawkins. Aye. Councillor Lefiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor Newell. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Sorry? No. Thank you. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Steadman. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Wiley. No. Councillor Wilson. Aye. Your Worship. Aye. Carried 10 4. Okay. Been done for the third time. What do you keep going? What do you want to do? Oh, 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 oh. We've got the annual plan. Um. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes. Not all the time. Not all the time. Um, it's been suggested that we, uh, this is an appropriate time to adjourn. We, we are coming back 
to um, a council meeting tomorrow, which is the annual plan, um, and we've, we've scheduled Wednesday, Thursday and Friday for that, um, and we can take that time. So what's the feeling around the room? Do we, do we, we want to carry on a now or, or council? Perhaps if you could just give me an indication by ha hands up who would like to carry on now for a while. And one, two, three. Is I've the got order? A Are you abstaining? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that was about five or six. One, sorry, put your hands up again who want to carry on. One, two, three, four, five, six. Those who'd, who'd like to adjourn now. One, two, Three, four, five, six. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> My suggestion is um, we do um, we we plunge on a little, but not for very long. We just do maybe get an item out of the road and then knock off for the night. That's Worship, um, can I suggest maybe we bring Fulton Mar forward? Um, and because we do have a legal representative here from the company and. Rather than having to bring her back the next day, we've also got these little masters games. Um, hmm? well, just to, yeah, I think we did change the agenda at the beginning. Point of order. We've confirmed the agenda in the current form. That will be ultra virus. I understand the standing orders. Um, no, we, my understanding, um, Councillor, is that that's not possible to change. So, look, we'll. <coughs> 75 for the Why don't we? Um, why, do, why don't we carry on with 19 and maybe um, 20? Uh, get them, knock them on the head. So 19 is the railway station consultation, the proposed pedestrian mall. Who's who's fronting for this? Richard. Sorry. Um, I was just subject to questions. I'm happy to move. Do you want to introduce this, or do you want to just go straight into uh, questions? Just a, a couple of very minor clarifications, and then happy to go to questions. Um, this uh, draft or proposed um, statement of proposal, pages 82 and 83, there's a couple of minor corrections in there. Under the proposal, where it states access, access will be retained for pedestrians and cyclists, that um, will also be uh, motorised scooters, mobility scooters and maintenance vehicles to be added in there, so apologies for that. And the last bullet point on page 83 where it says the amended enacted bylaw, um, that should read the pedestrian mall. It's just that our normal um, statement of proposals are around bylaws, so that was a copy and paste error. The pedestrian mall comes into place. Correct. Right. Anything about that? Mm -hmm. Okay. I had understood there was an amended resolution required, <coughs> but I could be wrong. Is that around item C? Uh, so the delegation within the um, committee manual sits with the chair of the hearings committee, so there's no need to change, change that. Right. Okay. C questions, councillors? Does anyone have any questions? Uh, Councillor Gary. Um, yes, um, Mr Saunders, a couple of questions. What's rat running? <coughs> Uh, short cutting. Okay, thank you. And um, I see that there's two mobility parks that have been um, proposed. Um, there are mobility parks there already. Do you think that's going to be sufficient and are you, you comfortable with the location from the interactions you've had with the disability <coughs> groups? Uh, yes, we're, we're comfortable with the location. The bottom of the access ramps and would, would suggest that that's the best location. Um, around the station. Uh, in terms of total numbers, it's something we're going to have to monitor and take feedback on, but it's the existing, uh, the situation, it seems to be the right fit given the number of spaces available in the area. And will they have a time on them? Oh, I would have it was, to come. Was it 180? I'd have to come back to you on that, sorry, yeah, Councillor. Maybe I saw 180. Um, the other question I had was around uh, the feedback from the Art Society. I see that there's two in the plan, two spaces for Otago Art Society, but the issue that was previously raised was about 
members dropping off very large pieces of artwork and then, and then sometimes having to pick <coughs> them up if they're not sold, and it comes only at specific times. Uh, have you had further interactions with the Art Society that would suggest that the solution that you have in there in terms of those two parks will address that? Uh, look, we, we had further feedback from the Art Society, and, and again, in terms of the location of spaces as they exist, those ones are um, right adjacent to the building and again adjacent to the access ramp so they are we would consider them to be in, in an appropriate location and they, they still would have um, the choice of using the pickup drop off space as well. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Councillor Vanders. Going back to an issue quite some number of years ago, um, <clears throat> where a figure of speech was used, call off the dogs. Is it uh, anticipated that rat running is simply seen as a figure of speech and you're not actually describing any of our citizens as rats? Correct. Good, oh, thank you. Um, seriously though, getting on to um, number uh, 20, this is on page 73, talks about two mobility parks adjacent to the railway station ramp were accessible to the public. Um, I understand from the map that the uh, mobility parks are still going to be there but I haven't been able to understand exactly how many parks we're going to lose as a result of this uh, pedestrian mall. Can you give us the figure? It looks okay. like about six, but it's hard for me to tell. Uh, so there's, there, there are six um, coming out. We are uh, at the Toy 2 end of uh, where the new coach parking ground, and that's, that's where that, um, we are reviewing the option of using those variable parking signs, which will allow us to um, turn them into car, turn them back to car parks on, on days where there's not the demand for coach parking. Uh, and I understand there's also an additional one coming out to provide for a new taxi park on Lower Stewart Street. And what about the parks that are currently either side of the main entrance of the railway station? Uh, a lot of them were used um, especially for um, uh, Saturday's uh, farmer's market, etc. Currently, I believe there's at least uh, six parks on one side, and I think maybe so five that's, on the other. So there's five, five, P3, uh, five P30 and one taxi stand on the north side of the building entrance. Um, would, would, they would come out as part of this proposal. So we would lose six parks there if you close the taxi one Inc and six some of the time because of the coaches on the other parks. That's correct. Yes. And yeah. And then the and then one on Lower Stewart Street to shift to provide that taxi park that's coming out of the railway station for Okay, so twelve or thirteen, however you want to look at it. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry. Um the issue over losing the legal road. Um legal roads again tend to be sort of enshrined. And I understand that there is a provision to actually turn a legal road into a pedestrian mall. Is there a specific consultation that you need to go through for that, or do you consider the trial that we've had to already be that consultation? No, this, this is proposing we go out with a statement of proposal to go through a formal consultation procedure to reach a decision. So the, the Act specifies we have to do that. The and trial that was because of the legal road issue. Uh, that, that's correct, that's the proposal okay. to turn it into a pedestrian mall requires that. All right. So it's depending on the feedback that we get, whether or not we can actually then go through with it. We have to consult on it. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Newell. Thank you, Worship. Uh, Mr Saunders, just a, a kind of a tongue-in-cheek um, request, but um, also quite a serious one. Um, after any major event, that aforementioned rat route is a wonderful way of, of stopping, stopping the traffic um, snarling up. Um, at the ironic um, intersection by the Cabri there. Um, is there any way that you could have um, sort of those magic up and downy bollards and on you know, uh, major occasions that you could, you could just drop them and let us through? Um, oh, because, like, it, it, I, like, seriously, because yeah. it, like, it, it snarls up there quite it, badly. Obviously, you've got 22,000 yeah, people trying to get home yeah, at once. I appreciate we We do have challenges in that area of town after a major event at the stadium, but I... I guess my view on that from a safety point of view is that if pedestrians become used to using a pedestrian mall, particularly given most events end in the dark, um, introducing cars back into that space for, a, for after a single event where they then are mixing with pedestrians again is probably not a good safety outcome. Other questions? Happy to move. 
So we move ben Councillor Vincent Pope, second Councillor Gary. Speakers. Um, just briefly, uh, Your Worship, um, I'd like to congratulate um, Mr Saunders and his team for trialling twice um, a proposal of this kind. It really, um, it's not the first time that people have said that um, the building is spoiled by large vehicles and indeed the parking in front of it. Um, but it's a very good, and, and the feedback from those trials has been pretty overwhelming from what we read. But it's a, perhaps a very good example of the value of trialling proposals of this kind, um, because it gets people used to the idea uh, and also the advantages and possibly disadvantages. So I think this is something, because it's not a final decision, it will be a very useful thing to proceed with and get on with it. Councillor Van der Vissen and Councillor Gary. I, I feel the need to remind uh, councillors that every park that we want to try and build in the city is going to cost us $35,000 uh, and that we are going to lose a dozen of them with this process. Uh, in terms of the view of the building, uh, the building is at least 10 times higher than any uh, car that's going to be parked in front of it. And there is, I think, an argument to say that, OK, it's all very nice to see just the building in its entirety with no cars evident anywhere. But then it also suggests that perhaps there's not a lot going on in the place and, and that um, there is that other side of things to consider. For staff to, again, be proposing a change which I can see some benefits for, but that loses us yet another dozen car parks and doesn't actually pick them up anywhere else, when I believe there are plenty of opportunities for other car parks to be maintained, is again an issue that I feel so strongly about that despite not minding particularly having a pedestrian mall, the fact that there has been no attempt to try and put those dozen car parks anywhere else, uh, I just can't vote for it. It's more erosion of the vital car parking that we need in the centre of our city and it's going to be so near the new hospital that it, again those dozen car parks at $35,000 a piece in terms of value are going to be sorely lost. So unfortunately for that reason I have to vote against. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm going to be voting uh, in support of this, and I'm delighted that we're going out for further consultation. Um, I'm particularly impressed with the way that we have taken into account uh, the needs of those with mobility issues, um, because trying to get people with mobility issues to places around the city uh, can be quite challenging, uh, depending on where you're going, and quite stressful. Uh, and also the needs of the art society, um, I attend many, if not all, of their exhibition openings and it's very well patronised and some of their exhibitions have people from all over New Zealand uh, submitting work. Uh, and some of them are very large pieces of work, so um, that's a really positive, that's positive news as well. I noted in the report there was concern on, uh, from tenants of the railway station around the loss of patronage, but that's often the first response people have to the idea that cars will be taken away, and in fact the opposite is true from, uh, from what we know, the research we know from, from other places that have done this. Um, as a tour guide for a number of years, I can say categorically that visitors uh, really enjoy when they come to our city for a very short amount of time, sometimes a matter of hours, um, they really appreciate being able to take a photo uh, of such a, a significant building without the presence of tour buses. They sometimes don't have the time to wait till the buses move. Um, and I seem to recall, and I'm looking over uh, at Mr Christie, uh, that the railway station is the most photographed building in the Southern Hemisphere, I was, right? Southern Hemisphere. So um, that perception is, uh, and that situation is actually really important. Um, and we often use it in our documents and so forth. So from that, all those perspectives, um, providing the needs of the tenants uh, have been taken care of, and they have, um, and the needs for those with mobility issues uh, have been taken into consideration. Let's go out and consult and see what people think about this uh, as it stands. So I thank the staff for their considerable work uh, and research on this. Councillor O'Malley. 
Just going to say, losing car parks, you've got a railway station. Don't, think, don't forget about suburban trains. <laughs> <laughs> Further speakers? Councillor Elder. Um, just noting that indeed we are taking car parks out and I do, I do agree with this, I think taking photos of buses in front of the most beautiful railway station in the world is rather horrific. Um, but noting that the number of tourists coming to Nenin isn't decreasing and the form of transport they're preferring um, and this is growing, is cars. I do think we do need to be aware of the landing place for tourists in Dunedin so that they can access all our beautiful um, amenities and facilities. So it's just an awareness thing um, and I just want to put it out there that that needs to be um, looked at in, in some way, shape or form. <laughs> More speakers? Your right of reply, Councillor Benson Pope. I'm going to put it. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? No, Thank you. That's carried. Thank you, Richard. Um, we'll do one more. DCC submission on childcare allowance policy for elected members of local government. Sandy. <coughs> do you wish to? introduce this briefly? I, there are a couple of um, changes I would like to alert councillors to um, <coughs> from the paper circulated with the agenda. Um, on the financial considerations and the summary of considerations, there's a figure there um, that is incorrect. Uh, page 88. There's a figure of 1,024. That figure should be the figure that is the maximum available under the policy. As drafted, the, the policy has $6,000. The other um, point I would like to draw councillors' attention to in paragraph five of the draft submission, where it's been suggested based on feedback that the rate um, that we the submission says that the rate, rather than be $15 an hour, as proposed by the authority, should be increased to the living wage amount of 21.15. Um, our advice would be, if that is to be the council submission, then we should increase the overall amount, as proposed by the authority, to cover the same number of hours as $15. So that would mean um, that instead of being $6,000, which is the cap, it would be $8,500. So that would just be a consequential change and that would need to be included. Were councillors to um, support that rate? Questions, Councillor Hawkins. Well. Sorry, I've sent around a uh, resolution according. Um, okay, um, that's. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to the, to the debate, but um, are there any questions? Councillor Gary. Uh, Ms. Graham, um, I, I did have a point of clarification. Um, and in reading the Remuneration Authority's papers on this, report on this, it talks about bona fide, um, they don't, didn't use those words, organisations, and I understand why you, know, you would need to be using that in order to have this paid. But my question is, how does that work in that my understanding, and there might be others around the table who have a more recent update on this, but in my experience, when you book your child in for childcare, you have to commit to a certain number of hours on, on or a regular day, regular time, which makes it very, very difficult in terms of uh, irregular hours that, that a, an elected member would have. And so I just wondered if there was any consideration given to that. <coughs> Check with drafting. Is that an issue that the um, microphone Sorry, just for clarification, are you talking about more like babysitters and like outside of your, your regular um, childcare kind of provider? N no, I'm talking about if you want to book. My understanding, and I might be wrong, in the Remuneration Authority's uh, report was that you would have to use bona fide childcare situations, organisations, including home-based care. My understanding, and as I say, I may be entirely wrong, 
uh, because it's a little old, this information. Uh, oh, my daughter's 21. Um, you had to book uh, your child in for a certain number of hours on a certain day, and you had to commit to that in order to get a place in a child care or in, in home-based care. Yeah. Um, if, if you just got a, a, a babysitter, sure, but I, I didn't that. think that that was a possible alternative. As I understand the wording of what's being proposed by the authority, that would be covered? further questions? So it's been moved. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, second to Councillor Elder. Councillor Hawkins, do you wish to speak to it? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Your Worship. And I, I appreciate there's, that there's an element of Turkey's voting for Christmas about this uh, in terms of um, supporting a, a system that is more encouraging of a wider range of candidates standing for election. But personally, um, I would rather stand and lose um, than stand and uh, win an election uh, were more capable people um, to feel that um, they weren't supported by a system to be able to stand for office in the first place. I won't bore people with summarising the submission, but the main points um, that are being made uh, through that uh, really um, are that the proposal was a very good start and that this is something that the Remuneration Authority has been asked to consider um, off and on for as long as, uh, as, long as I can remember. Um, the, the specific proposal around not being able to reimburse people who live at the same address as you, um, my feeling is that it's designed to stop you paying your own family, um, but it does, some, it does then weirdly preclude you from being able to pay your au pair who obviously uh, lives on site and for people with um, irregular work hours is um, a fairly common uh, uh, a fairly common option. Uh, I support the amendments around being able to pay people the living wage and the um, proportional response in, in what that um, overall uh, envelope might be. Uh, but most, uh, most importantly, I think, um, it needs to be set out such that councils don't have a choice whether or not that they reimburse people for these expenses um, like they do with uh, mileage or any other kind of expense. Um, that it is something that is given, uh, that is made available to people as of right. And while I would like to think that the Remuneration Authority will accept uh, our submission, which is um, aligned with the Local Government New Zealand submission and others, um, we can't guarantee that. Uh, and so B uh, is, is a commitment from this authority that should uh, the Remuneration Authority decision remain per the proposal such that local territorial authorities have to choose for themselves whether or not they offer uh, reimbursement for uh, childcare costs that this authority um, will choose to do that because I think it's an important signal for us to send at this point uh, in the cycle when people are considering whether or not um, standing for public office is a choice that they and their family want to make uh, rather than uh, a decision we make after the election when obviously it's far too late to influence the, um, the range of candidates that might choose to make themselves available. Uh, C um, is in reference to um, something that the Remuneration Authority and their proposal essentially put in the too hard basket um, around the, the, the paper talks about um, children and then also dependents uh, who are not children. Um, and, and while it's, um, I, I think separating those two things out isn't unhelpful for them, uh, I would hate for that work that they have by their own admission not resolved um, stops. And, and, and so it would be good uh, in our submission, uh, which would be the natural place to give effect to see, I suppose, uh, encourage them to continue that work such that um, support can be uh, made available for an increasing number of people for whom um, access to uh, support in this way um, is a barrier to standing f to represent their community, whether that's here or uh, anywhere else around the country. And I'd just like to thank uh, specifically uh, my colleague Julia McLean, who's a district councillor in Hurunui, who's done a, uh, a lot of work in pushing for this um, and, and lobbying and agitating around this. Uh, and the Young Elected Members Network within LGNZ who similarly have done a lot of work to get us to this point. Uh, the Remuneration Authority were fairly strident in their uh, lack of enthusiasm for considering uh, this as a legitimate reimbursement and so I think we've, we've got a long way to the, the paper that is in front of us and um, we're just asking to nudge them a little bit further uh, and I commend them for their work. Thank you. So Gary. Uh, I recall um, at around the time, just around the time of the beginning of this training, uh, there was a woman, I was doing some training of community boards for uh, what's now equipped, and 
Uh, I recall a woman there who was uh, lobbying around this issue because she was finding it particularly difficult uh, to contemplate uh, her work as an elected member uh, and managing her childcare matters. Um, over the time that I've been uh, an elected member, and particularly during my time as a community board member, I would come across uh, good people, people who wanted to put themselves forward for election, um, people who had something to contribute to the community, uh, but for whom this was an issue, and who would say, my children are really young and this isn't a possibility. Um, I would also uh, hear from people around my board table um, those who didn't claim for mileage. And I would say to them, even if you don't need to, you need to claim because if you don't, uh, then the next person coming along uh, may not be in the same position as you are um, and you make it difficult for them. Uh, and I would hate to think that there were people not standing in this next election for office uh, throughout the country, in fact, uh, in 2019, because uh, they didn't have the support in terms of childcare. Um, so I support this, and of course, uh, paying a living wage is very important. Uh, I, I am concerned about that issue of the irregular hours, because I do believe that is a bit of a problem, um, in terms of securing uh, childcare, but I just want to briefly touch on C, and I'm very pleased to see uh, that uh, clause there, encouraging the remuneration authority to continue the work on supporting elected members with dependents who are not children. Um, for those members of our community, and there are many of them who care for dependents at home through many different situations, um, participating uh, in local government would be an impossibility without support. Um, and so I'm very pleased to see that there. I, see it's, I know it's a very complex matter. Um, but I'm pleased to see that we're asking for the work to continue. Just because it's hard shouldn't mean it doesn't continue. Um, so I'm delighted to see this before us. Uh, it's not before time. Councillor Vanderbus. We are all employed here as elected representatives, as self-employed people. We do our own tax. We don't have superannuation. We can make various claims on various expenses, but actually very little, especially if you live in the city. Marvellous if you live miles away. And the uh, idea that we should now kind of think of ourselves somehow as not self-employed, but as uh, normal uh, wage earners um, is going to cause serious issues, I think. Childcare allowance, I've paid more childcare uh, costs, I think, than anyone in this room over the years. And I know how hard it is. In fact, it just about wiped me out when I had four kids and had a business trying, trying to uh, get, get going. So I'm definitely sympathetic to the uh, issue of having a whole bunch of kids especially and trying to put bread in their mouths. At one point, my family went vegetarian for almost two years simply because we couldn't afford to do anything else. Please, that there was no chance of me becoming an elected you. representative during that time. Anyway, here I am. The issue with childcare opens essentially uh, a potential for floodgates. We've got, if we're going to get away from our uh, inland revenue status as being self employed, the next thing on the list after uh, childcare is going to be superannuation. And I know that you know, MPs have a marvellous superannuation scheme already. Um, we don't, and I don't think, quite frankly, uh, the um, population can afford it, and I don't think we should get it either. I also have a worry about the staff time that gets prioritised by the short notice that central government gives us to make these submissions. We get dropped in it just about every other month now with yet another submission that unless we get the staff to read this, and in some cases the 100 page documents, I'm thinking of that one on uh, patents that came through a little while ago, and staff have got to go through all of that and then come up with a relevant submission, and then it's all got to happen in this very compressed time frame. I think that this is a new submission industry which doesn't really do anybody any good, 
And what really concerns me is that I think it was Councillor Hawkins suggested that all that ever happens with these submissions is that we end up giving central government a slight nudge anyway. Nudges which they seem extraordinarily resistant to. So uh, I'm sympathetic to the need for childcare, uh, but I don't think that it's going to be in our interests to vote for something that we want uh, to essentially increase our pay if we have children. Um, the uh, self-employed uh, would quite rightly then, and there's most of these small businesses in the country are people that are self-employed, um, they can't go and ask uh, to get childcare allowances. They're self-employed. We're self-employed as well. What's so special about us that we should get childcare allowances when all the other self-employed uh, in the country don't. So for all of those reasons, sympathetic though, they are, though I am to people that can't afford to actually be an elected representative, um, I can't vote for this. Councillor Wilson. Uh, thank you. Um, I will be supporting all of these remits and I am uh, grateful for the work that Councillor Hawkins done in adding C. I look around my table and I value the contribution of everyone who can speak and have a voice, but that comes from experience. And I have to my left someone who's got exper experience with um, dependency um, and it changes as we go. I've got um, equally, I want her to have a voice and be able to be here to express that voice around the table and say, same to the two to my right. They've got children under definitions now, but they'll also. Um, and I appreciate that Lee sometimes has to, Councillor Van Vis has to go away to, for his um, for children. The, I want him to be able to be around the table doing his job and being able to do that in a way that allows the people who vote for him to, be, to, to have their voice heard, and that's part of the democracy. So I, I'm going to turn this round on Councillor Van Vis and see that this is about uh, providing a voice from those um, broader communities that often can't be heard unless we ensure that they can be sitting at the table all of the time being able to do their job. So that's why I'm going to be supporting it. Councillor Laufisa. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge LGNZ for sending out this selected members profile. And um, I'm looking at figure six and the proportion of members aged between 18 and 40 years is 6% in 2016. And I think if we want to encourage, as other, um, as my colleagues have spoken about, encouraging um, immensely capable um, women and men as parents, as young parents, as younger people than us, then um, I think we need to think about the future. Well, I'd like to um, back up Councillor Laufiso's um, remarks. It was the, statist the statistic that I was going to use, that only 6% of elected members at local government are under 40. That is just not enough. And any mechanism that can enable um, more people who are younger to uh, contribute in local government is, to me, a good thing. I also have a compl completely the opposite view to Councillor Vandivis on the where we should be heading in terms of professionalising uh, our status. Um, I think that the fact that we can't get involved in KiwiSaver, we can't have uh, Superan, we can't have holiday pay, etc., actually detracts from uh, what is not a highly paid job that can suck up 10, 15 years of your life that you're contributing. And so I, I actually think that we should be moving towards being employed rather than self-employed. And with the, with the um, disadvantages that go with that as well as the advantages. But I think that ultimately it's about enabling a diverse range of people to be able to stand and contribute if they're elected to local government. That's really what it's all about. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether there uh, there'll be different factors affecting older people and younger people, but where we're short is younger people. The vast majority, our biggest cohort in local government, uh, are male, pale and stale. And if we're going to change that, we have to enable the alternatives, that, the diversity that we need in our, uh, in our local government. 
Councillor Hawkins, you will write a reply. <coughs> what a segue. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I wasn't going to dwell on... I wasn't on being that. personal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting there on all fronts, don't worry. Um, yeah, I wasn't going to dwell on demographics, but I think if we want our elected bodies to be more reflective of the communities that they represent, uh, then uh, it's up to us to identify barriers to that happening and try and reduce those barriers. And I acknowledge that this isn't going to fix it for everyone. I also acknowledge that it's not easy for people who are self-employed to make themselves available and flexible for meeting schedules either. And, you know, if they were to organise and unionise, who knows what they might achieve. <laughs> But all this, is, all this is doing is opening, uh, opening it up for more people. And, and it's, I mean, it's less of an issue, I acknowledge, in the metropolitan councils because, you know, we are reasonably well remunerated for the work that we do. And this is more felt uh, in smaller districts where people are uh, getting paid $20,000 a year if they're lucky. They're not doing um, proportionately less work than we are for that remuneration. It's just that the population base is how that, that, how that is figured out. And as a result of them being in smaller authorities, their meetings tend to be in the evenings outside the hours that traditional early childhood facilities are open, which makes childcare more expensive. And, and that is where the, the, the loudest support uh, and the most urgent support for this, um, for this has come from. In places like, uh, like Hurunui and Waimate, um, where, you know, who also deserve to be able to serve and represent their communities, but it is are too hard for them to do so. Um, so this is as much about supporting uh, our colleagues around the country as it is around encouraging people to stand uh, for election uh, here in Dunedin, although um, hopefully it can, uh, it can achieve both of those things. So um, I thank those around the table who have uh, supported this, and I look forward to the remuneration authorities' uh, considered consideration of it. Thank you. So I'm going to put it. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Division, please. Division. <laughs> Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Alder. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Hall. Oh, sorry. Councillor Hawkins. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Newell. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Steadman. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Councillor Wilson. Aye. Your Worship. Yes. Carried 12-1. Thank you, councillors. We'll adjourn now for the evening and we'll return. What time will we do to start in the morning? Nine o'clock? Nine o'clock, yes. Right. Well, we'll continue uh, this meeting then before we um, convene.